2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings in chapter 4. Starting in verse 1 through verse 7. It says this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. She said, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my boys as his slaves. Now Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant, she says, has nothing there at all except, someone say except, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. And don't just ask for a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour the oil into all the jars as each is filled and put it to one side. And when she left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. With all the jars full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's no jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We're grateful that from front to back, it is full of life, that it is not dead. Not one word in there is out of place. You have it there for a reason. And we ask out of 2 Kings chapter 4 that you would speak to us through this story of Elisha and this woman and these neighbors. God, this is an important moment in our lives, and we're asking you to change us. We're asking you to shape our perspective, remind us that you're enough, that everything that we have need for, you fill in our souls. And so we trust you at this time, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, I'd like to preach a message to you I'm calling, How to Live Bigger Than you are, how to live bigger than you are, and I think we would be remiss if we did not start this Sunday just saying, bucks in six. Was this not the most godly NBA playoffs run you've ever seen in your life? I just think it goes beyond sport. I mean, the Lord created all of the heavens and the earth in what? Six days. (laughs) And then on the seventh, we rested. And the Milwaukee Bucks won the world championship in how many days? Six wins. And then we rested on the seventh because we were celebrating so hard. Were we not? Bucks in six. And honestly, this whole playoffs run reminded me of the 1999 Bulldogs of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Now I know what you're thinking. Who are the 1999 Bulldogs? Well, the 1999 Bulldogs were a bunch of sixth graders from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, who thought they were it. We thought we were going to the league. My kids just watched yesterday, uh, Like Mike. Remember that movie? Yeah, we, I thought I was going into the NBA from the sixth grade. All four foot three of myself. Me and Muggsy Bogues. If he can do it, anybody can do it and we were playing on this tournament and I I didn't have a starting role I had what you would call Paul I was part of the bench mob if you will and uh, we were playing tournaments we play these tournaments you play five six games a weekend and so here we are on a Saturday playing our third maybe our fourth game of the day and uh, you know when you start on the bench uh, you can tend to get a little uh, distracted right because uh, there's the starters And then you have, like, the reserves, and then you have the guys who just make a living off of having fun on the bench. And so uh, me as the seventh man, I wasn't good enough to be the sixth man, so I was about the seventh man to come off uh, onto the court. And and you had our tenth and eleventh player were historically funny people, Uh, just unusual people to be around. And so when the game was starting, you found the bench often looking down to the end of the bench, engaging with the humor that was ensuing and so we were exchanging back and forth for quite some time and all of a sudden I hear my name called John number 21 in the game okay here we go I get in the game we're running an inbound play they set a screen for me I come around the outside I'm right at the three-point line let go of the ball and it wasn't until the ball was in midair that I realized I just shot on the wrong hoop We were running a screen because they were running full court press. 
I wasn't paying attention. I didn't even know which direction we were going. Fortunately to me, that ball hit the back of the rim and bounced out of bounds, and my coach called my name again and said, sit your butt down on this bench. I shot on the wrong hoop. Now, what I found out was that I didn't need the basket to go in in order for it to be humiliating. <laughs> I was humiliated for the rest of my basketball career. At least a couple more years, that was. Shot on the wrong hoop. Now, there's a few things in sports, specifically basketball, that I never had the privilege to hear from a coach. Like, I never heard from a coach, hey, John, we're going to throw you the alley-oop. I don't know why. I don't understand why I never got called that play. Maybe it had to do something with my height. Not sure. We were wearing Nike shocks back then, though, so we were working on our jump. I never had a coach say, hey, we're going to throw you the alley-oop. I never had a coach say, hey, John, we're going to put you on there number one. You know why? Because my defense was trash. I never even had a coach say, hey, John, you're taking the last shot. Every time the coach was drawing up that final play for someone to take a last shot, you know what I was thinking in the back of my mind? Praise, please, God, not me. Please do not run a play for me. I don't know why I was thinking it, because in the history of my basketball career, we never ran one play at the end of the game for me. I was on the bench. There's a lot I didn't hear in my basketball career, in my sports career, because I knew my role. I knew what part I played on the team. I played the important role of making sure that the starting point guard's seat was nice and toasty when he got back to it. <laughs> so that his legs would stay hot and so that he could get back in the game and do his thing better than I could ever do my thing. I learned that I had a role. I was there to help others be better and help them win the game. I have a role. The, the first thing we need to learn when we're trying to live a life bigger than the one we're currently living is that you have to know your role. Someone say, know your role. Know your role. You have to know your role. Let me, let me tell you this way. You have a role. Now, Enneagram 2s, where are my Enneagram 2s at? I know my wife's raising her hand at home right now. Our, 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 we've got three kids sick at home, so you can pray for her. But hear this Enneagram 2s. You have a role. Not all the roles. I know you want to help. I know you just want to do it all, but you have a role. You have one role. This goes for all of us. You don't get to play every role on the team. You don't get to be every part that you want to be. You have a role. And so this woman, she comes to Elisha. She's got a problem. She has an issue. For her husband has died, making her a widow. She has these two sons, and she does not have enough money to pay off the debt that was left in her family. Now, we're not going to talk about how the husband left all this debt and where it came from. That's beside the point here. The point is she had a need, and she could not meet the need. And so she comes to Elijah, this man of God. What we need to know is that her husband served underneath Elijah as a prophet for many, many years. And so she comes to the man who's been responsible for her husband, thinking, surely this man of God will understand my issue, he will understand my need, and he will point me in the right direction. I would imagine that she came to Elijah hoping that he had enough money to provide for her need. Why else would she go there? She needs help. She comes to the man who she thinks can help her. And what does Elijah say? He, he says, what can I do for you? He asks her two questions. He says, what can I do for you? And then he says, what do you, well, what do you have? And it's interesting this week, Pastor Jake pointed out to me that, that, that what Elisha was saying in that scripture, he wasn't inquiring what he could do to help. He wasn't like, you know, on the other end of a customer service call wondering, you know, how can I be of service to you? Actually, he was admitting his inability to provide for her need. What can I do? What can I do for you? He was admitting his inadequacy in this situation, which is really interesting because Elisha was an amazing, amazing person. One could say that he's the goat of the Old Testament. There's a debate going on. Moses, Elisha, MJ, LeBron. We settled it, though. It's Giannis. It's all good. 
history is being written before our eyes. Elisha was no mere role player in the narrative of the Old Testament. Elisha, up until this point, he was on a miracle spree. He was killing it. He was surpassing his predecessor, Elijah. Now that's confusing. Elijah gave way to Elisha. We're going to get that one confused for eternity. But Elisha was surpassing his mentor. He, he was becoming this figure in the culture of Israel that was unusually important. And here's this man whom is a man of God on a miracle spree, the leader of Israel, this now free people. And he says, me? What can I do? See, see the thing I appreciate so much about Elisha is that no matter what God had done through him, he never forgot how insignificant he really was without God. You have a role. And guess what that role is not? It's not God's role. It's, it's not God's role. Elisha did not assume to be the provider for this woman's need. That's not my job. That's not my role to be your provider. I'm just going to point you in the right direction. He was much better. He was a much better pointer than he was a provider because he knew that one of his one of those roles was his and one of those roles was God's. But so many of us like to step into God's role. And can I tell you and can we just agree with one another that trying to do God's role is nothing more than exhausting. It, it is tiring. It is exhausting trying to live in a role that we were never created for. And so we try and do it all. I need God to provide, but I don't see the provision coming, and so I step into that role. I need health and healing, and I don't see God doing it, and so I step into that role, and we start taking control of every part of our life. Friends, can I tell you that if you don't know your role, you'll wear out your soul. Fatigue will become your normal way of life. Some of us here, we're sitting here today exhausted. I say us because I feel it too. Some of us, we're sitting here today tired. We're, we're sitting here, our souls are a little bit weary. We're feeling worn out on the inside. And some of us, we're wondering, why is God allowing me to experience this over and over and over again? And I want to encourage you this morning and remind you that God never intended you to feel that because he, meant, he intended himself to feel the full weight of control over your life. You weren't meant for a heavy load. Bible actually says, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and tired and burned out and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You have a role and it is not God's role. God never intended you to feel the weight of his role. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. What's my role? It's right here. God's role is right there. My role is what I can see. His role is what I cannot see, which is why we're in church, because you can't live a life pleasing to God apart from faith. And we have to do with what we can see, what he's asked us to do with what we can see, and leave the unseen up to him. If you can't see it, it's his job. If you can't perceive it, it's his role. We don't need to step into God's role. Elisha knew. Elisha knew that he wasn't provider. And so this is faith. You don't know. Elisha doesn't know how to solve her problem. He just points her in the right direction where she can activate her faith. He points her in the right direction where God can show up in the gap. This woman has a need. What did she need? She needed money. Some of y'all like, I'm with her. She needed money. She didn't have enough. She had a problem. And so there was this gap between what she had and what she needed. Someone say, there's a gap. And I ain't talking about that clothing store that I used to work at seasonally. By the way, how has the gap 
maintained sales and never changed one piece of their clothing in that store. You walk in there, those are the same clothes as 1983 and as 1994 and as 1997 and as 2001 and as 2021. I don't know how they did it. It's amazing. There's a gap. There's always a gap, isn't there? There always seems to be a gap between what I need to experience and what I'm currently experiencing. There's often a gap between what I want my life to be and where I'm actually at. There's often a gap between the money that I need to pay for that thing and the resources that I currently have. There's often a gap between the grade that I need to get on that test and the mind that I feel like I have. There's often a gap in our lives between our results and our resources, between you and the outcome that you're looking for. And can I, can I encourage you today? Hear this. God's got the gap. He's got the gap. He's not asking you to do more, but he's asking you to do something. And so I've learned that just because you know your role doesn't mean that you'll step into owning your part. And so if we're going to live a life that's bigger than the one we currently have, we have to know our part, but secondly, we have to, or we have to know our role, but secondly, we have to own our part. You have a part to play. You don't just have a role to have. You also have a part to play. Elisha knew he wasn't the provider. The woman knew the same thing. She knew she wasn't the provider. She was just looking for the one who was. Oh, turns out it's not Elisha. He's not able to provide for me. You have to own your part. Now, a role can be so ambiguous, right? It doesn't demand action like a part does. When we think of roles, we often think of the, the 3,000 foot view of our lives. Like, I am a Christian, and so my role in the world is to be a Jesus follower. I'm a dad, and so my role is to be a loving father. I'm a husband, so my role is to be a loving husband. And I have all of these roles, which are great, but they don't often demand action in the most meaningful moments of your life, the moments where there's a gap. There's a gap between who I want to be as a dad and who I am as a dad. There's a gap between where I want to be financially and where I am financially. There's a gap between where I want to be in my career and where I am in my career. And I've found that roles often don't help in those spaces. It's knowing what our part is. And so we have to get down into the, into the, the everyday moments in our life and figure out what is the part. The part is specific. I believe that each of us keep coming back to church because there keeps being gaps in our life. And what we're looking for is to know what our part is to do about it. God is asking you to own your part. This woman, she owned her part. This woman comes to Elisha. Elisha says, you know, what can I do for you? But then he says, what do you have? And if you're the woman who's just told you that they're coming to take my sons, which, by the way, is a normal experience in that culture. Anybody thankful that that doesn't, doesn't exist anymore? Like, y'all may pay off that debt because they're coming for your sons if you don't. My goodness. She comes to Elisha on the brink of her sons being taken for a debt that they have in their family. And Elisha goes, what do you need? And you got to imagine in the back, or what do you have? And you got to imagine in the back of her mind, she's going, clearly not enough, Elisha. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here if what I had was enough to solve my problem. Clearly, I don't have enough. And so she answers the question, I have nothing except for some oil. Someone say except. Except for some oil. She has nothing except a little olive oil. The best thing to use for cooking on that grill. Griddle. Clearly not enough. I have nothing except some oil. And Elisha gives her a task. Interesting. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go around the neighborhood. I want you to ask for some jars. Empty jars, okay? I want you to go take those jars, go into your house, shut the door, and start pouring that oil into 
jars. Elisha gives her a task. Jars, shut the door and pour. Jars, shut the door and pour. He, he pointed her in the right direction, but she still had to what? She still had to do her part. You have a part to play. She had a part to play. Elijah had a part to play. We'll find out in a little bit that the neighbors also had a part to play in this story. And so her part was jars, shut the door, pour. And so she goes and does it. He pointed her, and she does her part. But how many, you know, it would have been real easy for her not to do her part. I mean, this is the most unusual thing one could be asked to do. I've asked my neighbors for a lot of things over the years. You know what I've never asked for them for? A jar of nothing. Someone comes to your house and says, hey, could I get a jar? Your first question is of what? And if they go, of nothing, what for? Not really sure. How many do you need? As many as you'd give me. And who told you to come here? God. Yeah, I bet he did. I bet he told you to ask for a jar full of nothing. Seems right. She's not the crazy. So, so part one, that's challenging obedience. Part two, shut the door. Absolutely, I'm shutting the door. I have no idea what's going to happen. I've just asked my whole neighborhood for a bunch of empty jars. Ain't nobody seeing this but me. All wondering, what is she doing with those jars? We'll come back to that. How easy would it have been for her to ignore her part? How, long, how easy would it have been for her to overlook what God was asking her to own. Now, I'm believing today that in your life and probably in the season that you're in right now, God's been asking you to own something. The reality is about this woman is that she didn't have enough oil to pay for her debts, but she did have enough oil to pour. So many of us waiting for the provision of God in some area of our life, are waiting for the thing to become enough that we might uh, meet the needs that God, that we see in, in front of us. And she didn't have enough to give to pay off her debts, but she did have enough to pour. Someone needs to hear this today. You might not have everything you think you need. You might not have everything you think you deserve, but you have enough to start pouring. What do you have? I don't have anything but a little bit of oil. Well, it seems like enough to start pouring here. I'd say it like this. There's always something you can do within the thing that you can't do. She couldn't pay her debts, but she could start pouring. You might not be able to just go get a husband and be married but you can start becoming the person of God he's called you to be in your marriage today. You might not be able to leave your kids an inheritance so that they can do whatever they want, but you can be faithful with the little that you have right now because God says that if you are faithful with little, he will give you and entrust you with much. There is always something you can do within the thing that you feel like you can't do you might not have enough to provide for every single thing in your life, but you have enough to start pouring. Friends, don't, don't underestimate what God can do with your part. The reality is that he can't use what you refuse to pour into his hands. God had a plan. There was a gap. God wanted to step into the gap. But it only happened upon her owning her part. Faith. Friends, faith is motion activated. Uh, faith doesn't work standing still. You don't need faith to do nothing. You need faith to move. You need faith to act. You need faith to do the thing that God has asked you to do, to start pouring the thing he's asked you to start pouring and so she does her part and God steps in the gap jar after jar after jar become full she owns her part and guess how it ended more than enough pay off your debts you and your sons live 
on the rest. She was just trying to get her debt paid. She got her life changed because she just kept pouring. Elisha knew his role, and she owned her part. So I think often in church, we move so fast past these moments. We ask questions like, what's your part? And then we go on and we talk about something else. I just want you to sit with this morning. I don't think you'd be here if there wasn't a gap. I don't think you'd be here if there wasn't a tension in your life that you were trying to manage. And though you know your role, I think it's time we get honest with owning our part. What's the part God's asking you? Come on, for a moment of just clarity, can we, can we all just close our eyes, myself included, together? Can we just sit here? In a moment where we don't have to be anywhere else. In a moment where we don't have to pretend. In a moment where we know nobody's looking at us, they're all looking at me. I'm here by myself. Nowhere else to be. No pressure to perform right now. God, speak to me. What's our part? Not in some grand sense, in some magical thing, but in a very small, real sense. What's the one, what's the thing I can start pouring? I got nothing except this. What's my part? Some of you hearing his voice for the first time, that's him. He's asking you to own, to own that thing. Nobody else going to own it. Nobody else going to come and take it. God asking you to pour out. Sit up with your eyes. I, I, I'd encourage you to sit with that one this week. What's my part? I often know my role. But man, I, I so easily overlook my part. I got nothing. I accept that, I guess. Don't overlook, don't overlook what God's asking you to own, all right? And, and so Elisha, he knew his role. Key number one to living bigger than we are is to know your role. This, is, this woman, she comes to Elisha and gets pointed in the right direction, and she has to own her part. Number two, we, we have to know our role. We have to own our part. But can we talk for a second before we close about probably the most overlooked portion of this story? The neighbors. They lent her jars out of her own need for them. These neighbors, upon being met with a ridiculous ask, empty jars. They probably, if they're her neighbors, and they're within a short walk for her to inquire for something, they probably knew her story. They probably knew you don't really have need for jars. I know you have a debt to be paid. I know you don't have enough. What are you asking me for jars for? And they give it anyways. For her own good. Notice this didn't serve them in any single way. And so it begs the question, what, what were they actually giving her? Were they really giving her just jars? I believe they were giving her more than just a jar. I believe they were giving her space for God's provision. Empty jars. What's in an empty jar? Nothing but space for something to fill. They weren't giving her jars. They were giving her space to experience the provision of God. Now, there were likely some neighbors who only gave her a jar when they had many more jars in their house. There were likely some neighbors who gave all of the jars they had upon her asking for them. And, and then there were some in the spectrum in between. Give her a couple jars even though they had a couple more. 
And what's amazing to me is they had no idea how it was going to be used. They just knew. He's probably putting something in there. You got to know your role. You have to own your part. But in order to live bigger than you are, you have to, you have to make some space. This is what we do every single week. What's this? This ain't nothing but an empty jar. We do all this not knowing what's going to happen. And then every week, someone comes in and gets their life flipped up, turned upside down in the presence of God. Why? Because we made space for him to provide for them. Not sure how it'll be used. I have space. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have someone over for dinner. I'm not sure how it's going to be used, but then they text me the next day. I had no idea coming into your home what God was going to do in my life. I don't know how it's gonna be used. It's just space. Friends, you can you can know your role. You can even own your part, but if you don't make space in your life for other people to experience the provision of God, what's it for? It sounds selfish to me. I don't, I can't really make space. I'm still waiting for God to provide for me. I can't really make space. I'm still waiting on God to give me that thing. I can't really make space. I'm too busy dealing with the thing that God has called me to deal with. Can I remind you, friends, that even Jesus himself didn't come for himself. He came to give his life and lay it down as a ransom for many. He made space. The example we have to follow is that often our role in owning our part is simply making space for other people to experience the provision of God in their life. How much space are you giving to those around you so they can see the provision of God? And so I'm going to invite you to stand. And I'm going to invite you to to ask God an audacious question. You ask him this. Come on, let's close our eyes again. You ask him this. God, who do I need to give a jar to? That ain't a hard question. But it is an audacious one. Because when God reveals to you your purpose on earth. I just, I just believe that, that my, my part plus his power equals my purpose. And when you reveal to me names, they're not just names, God. They're parts for me to own and there's space for me to make for other people to experience the thing I've already experienced myself. And so I give it. God, what's my part? Who are you asking me? to make space for. Trust that you're going to speak that to us in the name of Jesus. And the thing that we're going through, God, we just speak in faith over it. You're enough. You're enough for me. I'm going to make space for someone else. You have more than enough provision for me. I'm going to make room for 